Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by Blue Bank Resort at Real Foot Lake. Visit bluebankresort.com to start planning your weekend getaway. Thank you, Emily. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's very special guest, what is something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? I discovered that on Mill Ridge, we have an actual grist mill that was originally used in the Massengill Mill about 25 miles northeast of Knoxville. That is a very, very good fact, and I love photos of that. That's my one of my favorite photos to take at Discovery Park. It turned no matter no matter what the day is like, a photo of the mill turns out beautifully. Um, so today's special guest is Lee Ellen Smith, the founder of a nonprofit doing some great work. She's going to tell us about outside in and a lot of other things. Welcome, Lee Ellen. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much for asking me to be a guest on the show today. I'm, I'm very honored uh, to be here. And uh, gosh, I want to tell you a short story right off the bat. My son Jackson uh, said he would do a, a mock podcast with me last night. And we did that. And he said, Mom, just please try to remember, this is a conversation, not a presentation. And he and he said, you probably should tell Scott that, to feel free to interrupt you if he if you start preaching. So, Scott, if I start preaching, you know, I am a church lady. So just go ahead and interrupt me. You know what? As I have told several people today, the best podcasts are when I keep my mouth closed as much as possible and let you talk. So I'm just going to ask a few little questions and you feel free to take it any direction that you want. Um, but at some point, we're going to talk about um, those uh, hanging bags that I saw on your website that I've got my eye on. So um, first of all, back us up a little bit. Tell me, where did you come from? Um, what was your childhood like? Okay, I grew up on the banks of the Obine River, so to speak. My dad was a farmer, and that was pretty much an idyllic childhood, I suppose. But that's um, that's where I grew up. I went to school at Obine County Central, and then I did a couple of years of college at Freed Hardeman University in another small town, Henderson, Tennessee. Finished up with a business degree at UTM. And in between uh, those two things, I had a very long two-week period as a dental school student in Memphis. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, did, you didn't you didn't like the big city. So no, and nor did I like dental school. And today, I don't know an incisor from a molar, but I did learn one very important thing at dental school in those two weeks, and that was how to pivot and make a change. So I did do that. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, no, I like that. I've, I have learned that lesson many times uh, through the years. So what did you change to? Okay, that's when I decided to enroll in, in UTM. Uh, somewhere along that line, a young lawyer had captured my eye, and I, I weighed the pros and cons of becoming a dentist versus returning to Obine County and marrying the lawyer. And that actually won out. So I came back, went to UTM and, and did get a degree in accounting from UTM. So I worked for a while in, um, well, for a very short while in public accounting. Then I became the controller for an automobile dealership over in Dyersburg. And then we started having our family. And I realized that um, a high maintenance husband and four children kept me way too busy to have a career. So so I put all that on the back burner for a while. And you guys stayed uh, here in this area the entire time? Yes. We are both lifelong Obine Countyans. Yeah, that's My great. And Jimmy is actually the uh, general sessions judge here in Obine County. Excellent. And so uh, you're um, taking care of your family. And how many, how many kids do you have? So we had three sons the traditional way. And then we decided to go to China and adopt our daughter. So... That's so four children. They're all grown now. And that's really uh, the place I found myself a few years ago was when that last one started packing 
uh, their car for college, I began to realize I had been downsized. <laughs> and I was at basically what I kind of consider the half point of my life. My grandmother would be 104. I was about to turn 50. And I realized that um, I probably had a real good opportunity. A small window was opening for me to brush off that accounting degree and the sewing machine that I had used, uh, learned to use when I was about 12 and see if I could do something uh, to make a difference in my community. And that's really the beginning of Outside In. And so all along, you obviously saw need in the community, you know, through it and and were you were doing work all along, I'm sure, of one kind or another through your church or through your kids school. Well, that's true. It's just that at about that time is when our county's largest employer pulled up stakes and left. And, you know, that just sort of took the wind out of all our sails here in Obine County. And and that's really the moment when I started to notice the people that God was putting in my path and the struggles that they had and the challenges they had. For instance, I have a friend who uh, lost his job when Goodyear left. And, and I remember he had such a passion to become a law enforcement officer and he had completely reinvented his life away from an addiction that had actually led to a felony years before. And all that was in his past, but it left him with a history that made him really difficult for for many people to employ, especially law enforcement. And that was kind of an aha moment for me. That coupled with the idea that Um, really just one night at the dinner table when we were talking about people and struggles they had, uh, Jimmy said, you know, having a job is a big deal. And, And that was a moment for me too, to realize what does it take to create a job? And could I do that? And so if you, for people who don't know who are listening, O'Brien County at the time that you're speaking of was a town of about 10,000, um, give or take. And the number of jobs that left town with the Goodyear tire plant, I mean, it was close to 2,000. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a lot of jobs. Yes. Um, and with those jobs, obviously went you know, clothing stores and doctors and dentists and, you know, because you, that's a big chunk of people to lose because they all had families. And, you know, so you're right. It left a lot of people unemployed. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you started seeing this, you know, what are the ways you first started trying to meet that need that you saw? Well, it just kind of all came together for me. Social enterprise was really a brand new idea. And I had, I had started seeing these needs. I started trying to figure out what I could do. Um, part, of the, part of the population that had really captured my attention were people in recovery and struggling with an addiction. And, of course, many of them are chronically unemployed. So I, I toyed with the idea for a moment or two of, of transitional housing for them. That's a real need. But then I just settled in on this idea of social enterprise, creating jobs for people who had been chronically unemployed because they had all kinds of problems, problems like addiction or they've been incarcerated. They may come from a background of poverty. That's a, that's a huge obstacle for employment for so many people, especially in this area. And um, some people have a slight disability that keeps them from being uh, just able to get, you know, a lot of jobs, but it doesn't keep them from being able to do something. So that was really what I decided to, to, to investigate was this idea of social enterprise, you know, making a difference instead of making a profit. And, you know, my husband, Jimmy says, I'm really, really good at not making a profit. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, Kind of the downside of a nonprofit. Yeah. yeah Don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, there's so many different, if, if I were going to try to attempt to create jobs, I can think of all the different, um, all the different directions I would head, share with the audience where you landed. And I'm curious what inspired that well, uh, direction. Well, the, the place I landed was, was that, that sewing machine that I used when I was 12 years old to learn to sew, you know, back on the farm, you don't 
there's just not a lot of things to occupy a 12 year old kid. Uh, my brother was already out farming with my dad. My mother had lots of tasks to do around the farm without entertaining me. And that's really the, what I did. I used the sewing machine to entertain myself. I made my own clothes. I still remember the first thing I ever made. Uh, I adjusted the pattern to fit me and that didn't go so well, but, um, but it was really something I realized I had a knack for. And what I've come to realize as an adult, even as I talk to people about uh, choosing their own career and talk to my own kids about careers, I think the thing you have to look for is the intersection of your passion and what you're good at. And, you know, and I think a lot of us struggle with the thing that we're good at, but, but that I think is really just the thing that you are highly qualified to teach someone else. And I realized that I I was really good at sewing. I had a knack for textiles, putting things together. And I thought I could be good at teaching. So, um, you know, as Jackson and I were talking in our practice podcast, um, that is just, um, you know, you just have to think about how all those things come together. Uh, at the precise moment in time, and you realize this was the thing I was born to do. And that's really how Outside In has felt for me from the very beginning. And so what were the uh, what were the first steps in opening this nonprofit? <laughs> and, and yeah, did people, did people tell you, uh, don't even try, you're wasting your time, or do they humor you, or what was the response? Well, um, it, it was mixed response. And I have to say, I understand where the mixed response came from because our very first products were made from donated t-shirts. Now I have to smile when I think about that now. Um, and that came from a place inside me that was just not a risk taker. So should I have decided to start out with $30 a yard fabric making who knows what back then, I'm afraid that would have been a disaster because nobody is empowered when they make a mistake cutting a piece of $30 fabric. So we started out using donated t-shirts and we got real creative and we made lots of cool things from them. We made skirts and scarves and um, bow ties, you name it, we made it from a t-shirt. Did you make Keith Carver a bow tie? I did not, but we did get one in the hands of Mike Matheny, I think, back okay. in the day. <laughs> good, good. So, but I, I not, did not make him. He does like to wear them a lot, though. but so do you. I've seen yeah, you wear Yeah, I do too. But I didn't want to be greedy and be asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the news. Here's the real news flash. We do not make stuff out of T-shirts anymore. Oh, and that's too nor, bad. Nor do we upcycle anybody's used T-shirts, which is how we started to. So I still have to deal with that a little bit, um, which is really what they say in today's biz as rebranding. So we've rebranded at Outside In, and we do not make things out of T-shirts anymore. Now we buy beautiful new upholstery and drapery fabric, and we craft those, uh, those fabrics into travel gear. And when I talk about travel gear, that uh, leads me to that piece that you want to know so much more about, and that's a hang-ups garment bag. That's right, yeah. And as for for in a minute, we'll be talking about the website. But I noticed they had some stuff on sale today on their website, and I saw a couple of garment bags that um, were killer. And so I have to <laughs> decide between they they're really uh, great looking, and unlike anything you would find um, anywhere else. Well, that's what I, that's the first piece that we started making when we, when we rebranded to travel gear, uh, we came up with a really cool way to put a zipper in, which is for a seamstress. That's one of the hardest things to, 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 um, master. And, um, so we, we decided on a garment bag. We love the name hang up. And whenever I say, uh, when I talk about hang ups, I like to tell people we call them hang ups because they are made by women with genuine hang ups. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hurts, habits, and hangups. That's kind of the hallmark of, of folks who come my way for employment. So that was a perfect name. And I tell people, if you don't already have a hangup, you can get one at Outside In. <laughs> and from, from that, we've moved on to other pieces like tote bags and weekender bags and so forth. Yeah. What is your most popular item that you make? 
Right now, our tote bag is. It's really a very versatile piece. It also has a heavy-duty zipper in it, like the garment bag. And we put together a combination of fabrics uh, that coordinate. It's not too matchy-matchy. That's really out of vogue now. So we try to make them uh, just really eclectic and fun. Yeah, and um, I mean the the quality is really great, and they're v- everything I saw was really cool and colorful, and mm-hmm. you know r- really great. And it and it wasn't outrageously priced, you know everything no. is affordable. No, our our prices are very reasonable, and uh, uh, I just am proud of the quality that we have. We we work really hard, and you know I have to always anytime we get lots of ideas about things, Leal, and you should make this or that, and. Um, and I do love ideas, but but I always, at the end of the day, have to think about the skill level of my employees, and they've learned a lot. But you know, we we our our main job is empowerment, and the fact that we create something that's viable and beautiful in the workplace is a huge boost to us. And that's just. Um, you know, making something with your hands is really good for your head. And when we gather around our work table in that workshop um, and, and and make things together and we see an article made from start to completion, it's really um, it's really a neat, neat thing. Well, so how many um, how many people were are they are all or is it all women who work for you? How many? I didn't. Yes, okay. they are all women. Uh-huh. How many women work for you? So we have four right now, okay. and that's that's about you know our workshop is small, um, but but four to five people can work in there pretty comfortably most of the day. There's a small upstairs. I have an office up there, so sometimes I retreat up there. <laughs> yeah, my wife, uh, my wife's mother um, was a seamstress, and so my wife grew up making drapes. And yeah. I know you know what the uh, I, so I have a mental image of what the workroom um, is like. Um, and so what, what is the typical day like for someone who works, uh, for you? How, how are these things made? Well, we've kind of come upon a a pretty good system now that, uh, I still cut out some things, but then one employee cuts out the the bags. We kind of, we look around our workshop. We, I kind of keep a tab on inventory and, and what we need to fill out our inventory. We're really a, what I call a small batch manufacturer. When I go buy fabric, I buy enough for about 10 pieces of each, um, of each product, uh, 10 garment bags, 10 tote bags, that kind of thing. And those pieces will all coordinate. So we just kind of get started. We cut those out. Uh, one gal cuts them out and, and does like the first half of production and, and the other one then takes it from there and kind of finishes those up. We do a quality check at the end. There's a few finishing touches that have to be put on, one of which is a really cool uh, zipper pull made out of buttons. They're all handmade, and, and the little gal that's doing those is um, – she has a degree in art, you know, and just um, puts a lot of effort into making those really, really eye-catching and fun. And where um, are you uh, marketing these? Well, we are just mostly on social media. You know, that that social media uh, beast has to be fed every day. That really and truly is the biggest challenge that we've had uh, with our, with our uh, social enterprise. And, you know, we've known from the beginning that we always were going to have to be an e-commerce site. Our town is small. Uh, our community Elbine County has supported us very well. People have loved what we've done um, and have, have done their very best to support us. But, you know, to really thrive and grow, we know we're going to have to really uh, do that online. And um, so that's pretty much we're branching out a little bit with social media. We're buying more ads and trying to get out there a little bit more. Now, who, leverage. Who, hand, who handles the social media? You? Well, one of my employees, yeah, I was till I realized what a miserable failure I was. At it. <laughs> Which is um, uh, that that alone well, is a great uh, skill to have to know when you're going to be a miserable failure. I suppose so. Uh, I was able to hire a young lady in one of our employees is a young lady in Nashville, a recent college graduate. And so she's helping me with that. And we've also been able to hire uh, Elizabeth Pritchett, a young lady over in Martin. Um, she's been helping us too. She told me not long ago, I was whining about it, honestly. 
And she said, look, Lee Ellen, if it's painful for you, then you just need to get help. And that's, uh, that's what I did. And that's been a great move so far. Yeah, especially uh, considering what you're doing. You know, you have a great narrative. You have a great product. Uh, you know, the, I'm curious, though, you know, as you hit and as more people find out about it, do you worry about inventory issues? Do you think well, you ever exceed the need? I used to worry about that a little bit. Um, but but we've the last six months, I guess, uh, we've become – much more productive and efficient. And I can just see, I can just feel that we really are going to be able to scale this business. Uh, one thing that happened was we bought um, a new commercial sewing machine. Mm. Well, that was a game changer. The I really could kick myself now for not having done that five years ago. Um, and then back in, well, it was Giving Tuesday back in November, we ask for our fans to help us uh, get enough funds together to get a second one. And we, they did. And we purchased now a second commercial sewing machine. And that's um, those two things have really, have really helped us a lot. And so I, I do of course worry some, but uh, I have so many other things to worry about that that has to take the back burner. <laughs> do you, um, so you ship everything right out of there? Yes, yes. I walk right over to that post office as often as I can. <laughs> okay, so I was going to say, yeah, that's a lot because those things can seem like they're pretty big and and they could be yeah. heavy and you know. So well, we want to package our things like it's a nice gift for a customer to receive, and we we try really hard to make that experience even something that our customers will return to. I have to say, we have some really loyal customers. Um, a lot of return customers. I think people love our products and they see the giftability of our products too. They make great gifts. There's no size uh, involved. You know, people don't have to say, oh, this didn't fit or whatever. So, and I do know, gifts. I do know that you do sell in at least one gift shop, which is here at Discovery Park of America. Yes. You also sell yes. at other gift shops around Not town. Not too many, but we're starting to explore that a little bit. We need we to come up with like a, there. a Discovery Park of America line, like with dinosaurs. Ah, oh, that's a there. good point. We did a we did a line not too long ago that has a um, like a big cow's head with the antlers. You know, we I'll be on the lookout. I'll come yeah. up with something. We need to explore that. So we're gonna we're gonna come back after this break. But uh, in the meantime, I know people who are listening are like thinking, when are they gonna say the website? So is the <laughs> website outsideinworks.com? Outsideinworks.com outside in works. works.com so people who are listening who are waiting who are like when is he going to say the website so that's the website we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be right back if you have not yet experienced blue bait resort with its tasty catfish handcrafted beers and wide porch and patio on real foot lake then you need to start booking your trip now Blue Bank Resort is one of the best spots for dining, cocktails, live music, and gorgeous sunsets. Visit bluebankresort.com for more information. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you download and listen to your podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Lee Ellen Smith. She is the founder of Outside In, a nonprofit that both helps people um, in the community, but also creates some incredible looking uh, travel, what do you call them, travel accessories? Travel gear. Travel gear, um, very cool bags, uh, hang up bags, uh, just a lot of really cool stuff. So I uh, encourage everybody to go to outsideinworks.com and check them out. Um, what is your favorite thing on your website or favorite thing that you have, have created in this organization? Well, I guess it would have to be that tote bag just because they're so much fun to put together, the different fabrics in them. Um, it it fits up on my shoulder really well. Uh, it holds a lot of stuff. You know, one of the things that we really talk about at Outside In is that we're passionate about travel. That's what we love. You know, we're passionate about travel, but not about packing. So the thing about the hang-ups garment bag and the load-ups tote bag is, you know, you can select three 
outfits for the weekend, throw those in that hanging garment bag, zip it up, drop in your toiletries and, and uh, pajamas in the tote bag, an extra pair of shoes, and you're ready to get out the door and have an adventure. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of time folding and taking things off the hanger, that kind of thing. So I really love um, just the way it helps people just, you know, get on with their lives and not spend lots of time with no fuss and, and no packing, that kind of thing. You know, I'm embarrassed to admit that right now my one hang-up bag is in my attic, and so I had to travel somewhere the other day, and I got my um, – I, I have a suit bag that a suit came in, and so I just threw it in that, and that's terrible. Well, it's cold and, you know, you so – I'm, I'm going to have to get on there and buy one of those bags. I tell people that I don't know when we decided it was okay to show up at a hotel with your clothes in a plastic bag from the dry cleaners because it's not. It's really not okay. But I think we decided that because we couldn't find a beautiful garment bag. And that's where all your problems with that have been answered because Outside In certainly does have some beautiful ones, I think, on our website. I would think also the fact that um, through the COVID era, people got used to buying everything online. You know, like I even shop at Walmart before you know, I go and I pick this stuff up in the parking lot. So I think everybody got more used to yeah. that type of shopping. And I think that will uh, do very well for you also because people are used to doing that now. Yes, yes, that's true. So what's, what's, what's uh, coming up? What's in the future for you and your organization? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked that, Scott, because, um, you know, we love Obine County. We grew up here, my husband and I. Uh, we've lived our entire lives here. And, you know, in my mind, there's no better place that you could live or raise a family. But but we have problems in Obine County, just, just like everywhere else, and, and there are needs here, too. And so one of the needs that we've really noticed lately that we think we're in a unique position to step into is with uh, housing uh, for for women in recovery. We just need more. You know, those needs are are really uh, intense, and and uh, we just think that that's something that we would really uh, like to to come alongside people who are doing the hard work of recovery by creating a, a home here in Obine County for you know multiple families, uh, you know, seven eight women to share. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, and and you are absolutely right. Of all the needs, that's probably um, at the very, very top. So that's incredible. Have you uh, gone as far as picking out a spot or, you know, where that's going to be? Well, we have a pretty drawn out timeline right now. We have, we've done some really, I think, important work to develop the pattern that we want to follow. There's a place over in Middle Tennessee called the Blue Monarch. And we know the lady that founded that, and, and, and we know her program. She's really done an excellent job of, of creating something sustainable and has a huge impact. And uh, she has agreed to mentor us and help us. And uh, so we, that's really the main piece that we have um, think that, that we've put in place so far. Of course, the other thing, you know, many uh, treatment centers, programs, they have a social enterprise piece. They have to because people in recovery are not always able to work in the mainstream. And, and sometimes a mainstream work environment is just not good for people who are in recovery. So the fact that, that we already have a social enterprise that can employ people who need to live in a home like this is really, really huge. You know, if you don't, then you're basically creating two things at the same time, a social enterprise piece and a residential piece. And having already gotten eight years under our belt of, of, of running a nonprofit, that social enterprise is really going to place us, I think, in a, in a great position to start the residential piece. Yeah. What, what do you suppose, where did your um, passion to serve in this community, where did that come from? Well, of course, Jimmy does lots and lots of work uh, in the recovery community because of his work with recovery courts. And we've had friends who have, you know, been involved in addiction and frankly, you know, people in our family, you know, if your family has been untouched by addiction, you should really, really consider yourself very, very fortunate because uh, the people with addictions who need treatment, 
that number of people is getting larger every day, not smaller. Yeah, that's um, it's. I mean, you guys are doing incredible work, and I know that it's very much appreciated by many because you know you're right. The whole area has been devastated, the whole region, mm-hmm. and probably I guess the whole United States. The opioid crisis and addiction, and um, well, that's really great news. Um, I'm excited to hear what you guys are going to do, um, and then of course you're also going to design a hang up bag with dinosaurs on it, right? <laughs> dinosaurs, yeah, that's what we're looking for. Okay. Okay, we'll do yeah. what we can. <laughs> yeah, I might wait and buy my hang-up bag. I can have no, two. No, don't wait. <laughs> don't wait? Okay. I might get have two hang-up bags since, I, since my other ones are in the attic. There you go. That's a good idea. Well, you thank know, you. So- I just wanted also to say uh, uh, one thing, Scott, that yeah. I hope you'll, you know, the, the gifts of the Kirklands to make Discovery Park, that really inspired people in Obine County. And I was one of those people. You know, I, I really think that, that that's one of the things that sort of set set my heart on making a difference. And I just, uh, just a huge thank you to that family for, for all they did. And another thing I just happened to think about when I was connecting all the dots about our um, visit today was um, thinking about a, a lady named Jean McMillan, who from day one of my idea about outside in said she wanted to be a part. She had made a new year's resolution to get involved with a nonprofit that was going to help empower women. And I announced my idea to my workout buddies, uh, like about the middle of November of that year. And she came up to me later and said, I want to be a part of that. And, and she has been such an integral part uh, from, from that point forward. But the, connectedness comes from the fact that she was from Massachusetts and she came to Obine County because she had gotten a job with Kirkland's. So I got to thinking about that and I thought, you know, if it hadn't been for Kirkland's hiring my Jean, sometimes I call her my Jeannie because <laughs> she can do so many things. Uh, that that was that was really a very fortunate thing for me and for outside in that that uh, Kirkland's brought her to Obine County. So I just thought that was a cool connection. And you, and you bring up a great point, uh, the Kirkland's and yourself and, and Jean and, and, you know, giving back is way more rewarding than people could ever imagine. Yes. Um, if, if there's somebody listening who says, I want to help her endeavor, what's the best way for people to connect? Yeah, so we would just love to hear from anybody, especially with this new uh, goal and dream we have of the residential home. Um, we would really love to connect with people. You can reach out to me with an email, at Lee Ellen, L-E-E-L-L-E-N, at OutsideInWorks.com. Um, of course, our website is OutsideInWorks.com. We have a Facebook page, Outside In Works, and Instagram at Outside In Works also. So all those ways, we even have a telephone at our at our workshop, uh, 731-624-0015. We love to answer that. <laughs> So any of those ways, flag me down on the square, flag me down on the square in Troy. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Well, we'll, we'll uh, put links to all those in the, in the show notes as well. So that if people want to connect, they can, because I know you're a nonprofit like we are and every contribution, every, everything anybody can do to help every volunteer hour um, is invaluable for all of us who are in the nonprofit work. And that, that idea coming in our workshop and, you know, saying a kind word to, to the gals that work there, that is so encouraging to them. We love that. I mean, I would think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would think if somebody even dropped lunch off one day, that would be <laughs> yeah, much appreciated. That's happened a few times. It is very much appreciated. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for spending some time talking with us a little bit. And congratulations on the success of, of the work you're doing. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.